for the dhikr as well. There's a correlation, there's a connection between the word salah and dhikr. We obviously know because Allah has dhikr in it, but there's something else. What does Allah tell us about dhikr in another place in the Qur'an? الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا Standing up. وَقُعُودًا Sitting down. وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ And on their sides, lying down. Think about salah now. How do, we, how do we perform salah? What do we do in salah? We stand. What if I break my leg and I can't stand? Then what do I, I don't pray salah anymore? How do I pray then everybody? Sitting down. What if somebody is paralyzed or laying in bed in the hospital, they can't even sit up to pray. Do they still perform salah? How do they pray? Lying down. Dhikr applies in all times, in all situations of life. Salah is no different. The one committed to the message of Allah, the one committed to delivering the message, spreading the message of Allah, is somebody who's committed to his salah. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu has been stabbed. He has an open wound in his stomach. He's lying, he's fading in and out of consciousness. The t- he hears the adhan being called, he tries to get up, they say, what are you doing? You have a hole in your stomach. What are you doing? He says, I have to perform salah. He says, look at you. You're bleeding out right now, you're dying. What do you mean you have to go perform salah? He says, I remember the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa telling me, one who doesn't perform salah has nothing of the deen in his life. No salah, no deen. I have to go pray. No choice. The Prophet sallallahu in the last few days of his life, you had ibn you know, You know like when somebody can't walk on their own, they put their arms around two people's shoulders and you kind of carry them? The Prophet ﷺ would go for salah like that, and the Prophet ﷺ, they would say about him, it's mentioned in the hadith of Shama'il, when he would stand in a group of people, he was a little bit taller than everybody else. He wasn't like really awkwardly tall, he wasn't like, a, like seven feet tall or something, but he was just a little bit taller when he would be standing in a group. So because they were carrying him on their shoulders, the hadith actually mentions that his feet were dragging on the ground behind him. But he still went for salah like that. So the person's committed to his salah. Wa aqimis salat alidikri. Do you want to go forward from here? Yeah. Or uh, to the end? Wait, wait, wait. Let's do one more thing here before we jump to the end. Okay. Uh, so, the importance of salah. What's the urgency? Why should, you know, you're told to do something a lot of times, but you don't rush to it. Deadline. You know, you, uh, and this is a common thing. When you're told something good, you say, yeah, I'll get around to it eventually. Sure. You know, I really should do that next semester. You know? Or as soon as I graduate. Or as soon as this. As soon as that. Allah says, inna sa'ata atiyatun. The hour has, is pretty much arrived. It's on its way. It's right there. He used the more immediate form of the sentence, the ismiya form. It's just the, around the corner. And the preparation for it is in the ayah before as what? لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدني وأقيم الصلاة لذكري. If you want to be ready for the hour that's coming, and the only reason you don't see the en- the urgency of it, أكاد أخفيها. I'm almost hiding it. He didn't say I'm completely hiding it. He said I'm almost, almost hiding it, meaning there will be signs of the hour coming, right? And the, the signs are described by the Prophet So Allah didn't say I completely hid it. I'm giving you some signs, and the more signs you see, what should increase? Your preparation. Your salat should increase, your dhikr should increase. That's what should, what's supposed to happen. So he says, لِتُجْزَى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا تَسْعَى And so I'm almost hiding it, so that every person can be given what they aspire, what, what they made effort towards. And this is the final point I want to make for you guys, inshallah ta'ala. I met this brother two, uh, yesterday, ironically. Pulls me over, he says, Brother, I saw, I saw this video on YouTube, and uh, I'm just really paranoid that the Dajjal is coming, and... Uh, you know, all the signs have been fulfilled. Have you seen the dollar bill? It's got one eye on it. And you know the hadith? And then he, give, he gives me the whole nine yards, right? I was like, yeah. I, and, I, and I just, my, my eyes bugged out. I was like, what are we going to do? He, he gives me this whole thing about the Freemasons taking over and, you know, the signs of the hour being established and, you know, uh, this and that. Everything's coming together, brother. You know, and, and this big, big, you know... Uh, uh, troubles on the horizon and the jal is already here, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, you know what? What should we do? <laughs> what should we do? He goes, I, I don't know, I think we should leave the country. <laughs> I was like, how, how about we should make salat? <laughs> how about, be, remember, you know, Allah is telling us the hour is arriving. You should get ready. How should you get ready? 
make, be Allah's slave and make salah, make proper salah. The, they will, there's nothing that will prepare you better for the challenges that are ahead of you than the prayer. Allah is talking about prayer in the battlefield. Allah Azza wa is talking about prayer in every circumstance. SubhanAllah. This is something to be taken very, very, very seriously. You know, I didn't even plan it to be this way, but man, this is turning out to be a really strong pitch for you guys to attend meaningful prayer. And I really hope you do. Inshallah ta'ala. Anyhow, let's, uh, you want to go towards something to later on in the surah before we wrap up? Basically all the way to the very end. The very last page of the surah, ayah number 132. Since we are focusing on the topic of salah, at the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes back to the topic of salah as well. And especially because this is somewhat of a family environment, there are families here. It's very important to understand this, that once again, that message of da'wah comes again. But subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions one aspect of da'wah, which is the most important, but also the most easily overlooked. How common is it, once again, I'll kind of use the example of that, that brother that Brother Noman mentioned about, that that brother who, you know, is giving the khutbahs and giving the halaqahs and giving the lectures and he's going around and he's doing the qiyam and he's doing this and he's doing that. But what, does he ever sit down with his own younger brother, younger sister? Does he ever sit down at home himself? You know, the da'i who's going around talking to everybody. What about his own wife and kids? The sisters who are attending the Qur'an study circles for 20 years now. And mashallah have a very thorough understanding of a lot of the Qur'an. What about, what do they share out of that at home with their own families, with their sisters and their friends and their cousins and their own relatives? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of our first and foremost obligation. And also once again, teaches us a very important lesson about fulfilling that obligation as well. Allah says, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَةِ Speaks directly to the Prophet ﷺ and commands him, وَأْمُرْ You tell your family. Think about this for a second, okay? The Prophet ﷺ is preaching to all of humanity. He's concerned with everybody. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ All of humanity, all of mankind. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow him then to outsource the da'wah or the education of his own family. He says, no, no, no. The Prophet could have been like, okay, listen, since I'm taking care of everybody, how about somebody takes care of my family? Make sense? No. You tell your family to pray. What more ahlaka bis salah? You tell your family to pray. That's your job. You don't get to outsource that. And this is something I, I, I've, I've served as the imam of a community. And co in communities you have families and it's a very common predicament. We outsource the Islamic, the basic Islamic education of our children to other people. We outsource it. You know the Qadi Saab, the Mulvi Saab, the Imam Saab, the Sheikh Saab, whoever it is. He'll teach my kids Alif Ba Tatha, he'll teach my kids how to pray. And it's become a whole industry. But rather, we ourselves are responsible for teaching our kids the basis of the deen. When you are not the first force, uh, first level of education for your children, when you do not establish yourself as an educator for your own children, later on in life, when they become teenagers, now you want to start imparting Islamic advice or telling them what to do, they don't listen. Then you come to the imam frustrated, my son doesn't listen, my daughter doesn't listen, my kids don't want to listen. Well, because you were never, the, you never established yourself as their religious, dini educator in their life. You were their parent. So when they still need to buy clothes, they come to you. When they're hungry, they come to you. When they get hurt, they come to you. When they want to talk about something, they come to you. Religious knowledge or advice, no thank you, I'll go get that from somebody else. You established that precedent, you established that relationship. So Allah tells the Prophet here, what murahlaka bis salah? You tell your family to pray. Now, how will you be effective in commanding your family to pray? Wastabir alayha. Wastabir. Once again, this word is tabir. This is an exaggerated form of the word sabr. And the word sabr literally means to tie something down. To tie up something. Wastabid, you be very extremely regular in particular, alayha upon it, on top of it. You be very watchful over your prayer. You be very regular about your prayer. You be very punctual about your prayer. That's how 
It'll be effective when you tell your kids how to pray. And when you tell your kids to pray. That's when and how it'll be effective. This is one little humble piece of advice that I often give to families. Is that, you know in the masjid the time for iqamah is fixed. 9.15 Salat al-Isha, 9.15 Salat al-Isha. Even if the imam doesn't show up, 9.15 Salat al-Isha. We have to pray. Now for brother, time is fixed. But at home, do we have time fixed? We know Isha time starts, or I'll give the example of Dhuhr. We know Dhuhr time starts at 12.30, and Asr time comes in at 4 o'clock. So we know we have like this three and a half hour window. And we'll pray whenever we get around to it. Right now it's lunch, right now it's food, right now the phone, right now the email, right now the kids came. And we just kind of, whenever somebody gets time, wherever they get time, they just hurry up and quickly pray. We need to, prayer time should be fixed at home. What did the Prophet ﷺ tell us? One of the most beloved acts to Allah is the salatu ala awwali waqtiha. As soon as the time for salah comes in. If you want your children to learn how to pray, have your son call the adhan at home. When the time for adhan comes. Go, everybody make wudu. Everybody get together in the living room or whatever the room where you have enough room for everybody to pray. And everybody line up and perform salah. If the husband is home, the father is home, the son is old enough, lead the congregation. Pray in jama'ah. Time for salah at home needs to be fixed if you want your children to learn how to pray. When we show them a lackadaisical attitude about salah, then that's what they learn. So this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet wasallam. You command your family to pray, and you be very extremely regular and particular about it. Anything to end? No, I am completely uh, overwhelmed. So I'm going to, inshallah ta'ala, and plus salat time is coming. Salat is coming. So let's inshallah ta'ala take a, a break now. Jazakumullah khairan all of you for listening. I hope this was of some benefit to you. May Allah Azza wa enlighten our hearts with the reminder of the Qur'an Amen. and take the good of what was said and enter it into our hearts and have it implemented in our lives. Amen. And anything that was said that is incorrect or, uh, or untrue, may Allah remove it from our hearts and may Allah forgive us for any mistakes that we make. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.